Hallelujah. Come on, church. Let's give him a shout of praise. In this place, we thank you, Jesus. We praise your name today. And we pray that your light would shine in our hearts as your word is spoken. As we look at you in your word, we pray that you would shine your light into our hearts. And as we've sung that, Lord, you would have your way, your way, not our way, but your way. That's our prayer. That's our hope that our lives would not just unfold in the way that we choose and the way that we would desire for them to unfold, but truly you would have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Come on, let's give him another shout of praise in this place. Amen. I'm just going to ask James to stay where he is. Isn't it great when James plays? Really is. Well, over the last few weeks, as you can see behind me, we've been looking at this whole aspect of reaching out. And we've looked at various passages in the Bible to show us the importance of our commission that we've received from Jesus to reach other people within our world, within our lives, with the gospel message of His goodness and His grace and His saving power. This morning, we're going to take it in a little different kind of way. And we're going to look at not just reaching out within our world, but reaching one another. Getting to know one another within our home, within our family, within this church. And we're going to look at that and we're going to see the importance that the Bible places on it. You see, God just doesn't want us to be driven to reach the world beyond these four walls. God wants to build relationships within his church that are strong and healthy and vibrant and growing and going somewhere. He really does. He doesn't just want us solely to attend a gathering like this, although this is very important. But also beyond this gathering, he wants each one of our lives to mesh together for it to be a blessing and a resource to another. And to do this, we're going to see how Jesus related with people, not just in large crusades. He did that amazingly. But we're going to see how Jesus went into people's homes and met them right where they lived. Jesus was at home in people's homes. He really was. And you know, the two main priorities that we have as pastors and leaders within this church, the two main priorities is having a large, joyous celebration gathering like this. We do it every week. We love it. Isn't it a blessing? It really is. To be able to come to a large celebration gathering like this, but also equal importance, equal priority as this large celebration gathering has amongst us, equally important is the small connection that we have with one another through our connect groups. We feel that it's so important for every person that is rooted and planted into this house to be a part of a connect group. Now, I haven't, you know, we've, we've kind of given this out over the years and we have, you know, encouraged you. And that's what I'm doing again today. But more and more, I just want to let you know what's on my heart. I want to let you know what the Holy Spirit is pressing on our hearts as pastors here. Not to put pressure on anybody, but just to open a wonderful new blessing and resource for your life. For your life. And that emphasis is centered in the home. 
in our connect groups. We have some great connect groups. They're varied and they're different. And they're such a blessing. And maybe the majority of us within this house are in connect groups. But I feel it important to talk and direct our thoughts in this area this morning and will be doing in the coming months because do you know what? God's Word places a priority on our meeting within homes. It places the priority on meeting in large celebration gatherings like this, but also it places a priority on meeting within homes. Do you know, I don't know if you found this when, when you come in here. You know, lots of times there's so many people that you miss. There's so many people just on a normal Sunday that, that you want to talk to, but you know, somebody else chats to you and that person that you want to meet, that person that you want to see, maybe you don't end up chatting with them for weeks and months. Well, the home, the connect groups that we have really bridge the distance between what's large and sometimes impersonal to something that's connected and relational. Please, this morning, I, I really believe, do you know what? This isn't going to be a message that, that is spectacular. This message is going to be kind of maybe a bit rugged and a bit raw, and it's not going to be spoken perfectly. But oh, the importance of this message. I'm telling you, the importance, if we can understand the blessing that awaits each and every one of us within the homes that have been provided and opened for us to connect and relate and be a blessing. I'm telling you, your life, your life really is going to be enriched. You know, Faye and I have been part of a connect group now for, for many years. And it's been such a blessing just for us personally to have other people from this house speak into our lives good things, enriching things, not always, you know, scriptural things or things that you would associate with church, but just comforting things, things that would cause you to be enriched and strengthened at the moment where it's most needed. And, you know, we've watched our family, we've, we've taken our children to connect groups from, from quite a young age. And um, I never forget the first time we were going to connect. We go to Lee and Claire's connect group. And sometimes, you know, we go to their home. They host it in their home. And we host it in our home. It's a wonderful blessing to open your home to people. Oh, what a joy it is. I tell you something now. Some people might fear it. I understand that. Some people might, might see it as a, as a duty and as a task. Yeah, there's some, maybe some work and some effort and some cleaning to do and a mad rush to take on before anybody comes into your house. We get all of that, but I'm telling you something now. We have received far more than we've ever given, far more. And I remember, you know, that our children... Um, just coming to connect and enjoying it and being so excited every Thursday night or every second Thursday night. Man, they'd be buzzing. Are we going to connect tonight? I'd pick them up from school. The first thing off, off, their, off their lips wouldn't be, hiya, Dad, lovely to see you. It would be, are we going to connect tonight? And that would be the topic of conversation on the way to school and the topic of conversation on the way home from school. And it was wonderful to see that, that's a healthy sign. It really is. And um, I remember the first time when Faye and I couldn't be at Connect. We had to do something. Um, we, had, we had to travel somewhere in relation to, to, to church. And we, we were just faced with the dilemma of getting the kids. We didn't know how we were going to get the kids to Connect Group. And we didn't know really how we were going to break the news to them that they weren't going to be able to go there on the Thursday. And we said to him, said, oh, look, you know, mummy and daddy's going away. We're probably not going to be able to make it this Thursday to Connect Group. You're going to have to stay with, with nanny and grampy, which they love. Do you know what? 
they were like four kids started crying. They were desperate. It was like their world had come to an end. They just wanted to be in connect group. And uh, they just, they, 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 they wiped their eyes, dried their tears. And then just, I think it might have been Daniel because he's a solutions man. He said, well, he said, I know what to do. He said, Nanny will just have to take us. So Nanny and Grampy did take them. But you know what? Connect group has been such a blessing to our lives and to our children's lives. And maybe, you know, you're not in a connect group today. I want to just encourage you on your journey. Not pressure you, but I want to encourage you. If you're cautious, absolutely fine. But I want to encourage you to start to think about it. Start to pray about it. Because you know what? We need, we really do need each other. We need each other and we need to reach one another in our homes and in the groups that we have. They're available, available to you. You know, um, Pastor Rick Warren, pastors are, re- you, you may have heard of this pastor. He, he pastors a really large church in, in America called Saddleback Community Church. And I think there's over 40,000 people that attend that church on a Sunday. And, um, you know, he, he, he actually is part of a connect group. As large as his church is, as busy as his ministry itinerary is across the world, his focus is within his connect group. And he believes it's so important. He, he, he makes this statement when he, when, he, when he says, in order for the church to grow large, it has to grow small. And he's not just talking about a numerically large church. He's talking about each and every life. If your life is ever going to grow large, it has to go, grow small. It has to be planted, yes, in the large celebration in a service like this, but also it has to be connected with the saints within a home. It's biblical. You know, he went through, him and his wife went through a horrendous ordeal a few years ago. And um, I actually, I actually listened to the, to, to the interview where his son, he, he lost his son. They lost their son through suicide. And um, obviously, I mean, they were just completely devastated. They didn't know what to do. You know, he's leading a large church. And he, he had to take six months off as a pastor. Because it hit him and his wife, Kay, so hard and so fiercely. But you know what? He said this. He said, even amidst that grief and that devastation, the first people on the scene at my home, camping out round the clock, were my connect group. And they were there helping and serving and just being who he needed them to be. Doesn't the Bible say, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep? You know, the church is a community. The church is a family. The church is a body. And the Bible says that when one suffers, we all suffer. Psalm 68, this this emphasis from God's heart for the home is right throughout the Bible. Psalm 68 verse 6 says this, that God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. God sets the solitary in families, the life that is alone, the life that is isolated, the life that has no hope. God sets that life in families, in homes. God does not want any person to be lonely. God does not want any person to be isolated. And if we are going to reach out to a hurting world, if we're going to reach out to a lost city, 
If we are going to reach out to lives that are are seeking meaning and searching to discover the, 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 the hope that they need to be fulfilled in Jesus, we're going to have to not only bring them into a large celebration service like this, our very homes have to be the vehicle. Our very lives, our families have to be the means that actually become a place of community and communion and help for those that are solitary and alone. You know, I, was, I went to Tesco's yesterday with Faye. And um, as I was walking in, I saw a man that I hadn't seen for 10 years. He used to come to this church. I said, buddy, how are you doing? I couldn't remember his name. And uh, he, said, he said, I remember you. I said, I remember you too. He said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm living in Pontypool now. I said, what a fantastic place Pontypool is. And he looked at me. He said, do you reckon? I said, yeah. I said, Pontypool. I said, it's fantastic. I love it. I said, what are you doing? And he, he just recounted some things that he'd been through, crashed and burned, life in, in, in difficulty, and sort of struggling on through. And he talked about, you know, him and his girlfriend, and they were, live, they, they, they were in, the, in the process of moving to another part of Pontypool. I said, hey, mate. I said, listen. And I told him where we lived. I said, why didn't you come and over? I said, we've got a group in our house. We would love to see you. And he's going to give us his, he's going to send an email, give us his details, and he's going to come on over. But the point is this. It was just a normal day on my way to Tesco and an opportunity came to give an invite to somebody that is estranged and lost and isolated and lonely and troubled by life. An opportunity came, an invitation came, and he may not be ready at this moment to step back into the church, but I think he's ready to step into a home, into my home. You know, when we look at Jesus' life, we could go through many, many different aspects of his life. But you know, some of the greatest miracles that Jesus did were actually in people's homes. In the home. Jesus performed some of the greatest miracles right in people's homes. Some of the greatest teaching, some of the greatest guidance for life that we still rely on today, check out where he spoke that stuff. It wasn't in the, in the high-rise architecture of a synagogue that people associated as holy and as God living there. It was in the, the most rugged, commonplace of everyday people in homes. That's where he spoke. That's where he loved to be. That's where he brought blessing. I'm going to read to you from Luke's Gospel. A few verses. And what we're going to read about is of an occasion where Jesus went into somebody's home. And something amazing happened. And as we read this, just imagine if this happened in your home. Because it possibly could. It really could. God could use you to do something in somebody's life to change the course of their future, but also to change and shift the perspective of other people in relation to God's love and how it reaches people unconditionally in whatever state they're in. Jesus in Luke chapter 7 was invited home to a man's house who was very religious. Simon his name was, he was a Pharisee. And Simon invites Jesus into his home and I'm telling you now when you open your home to Jesus, anything can happen. Anything can happen. This man invites Jesus in, 
And little did he know that somebody was going to walk through the doors that day that was going to shake his whole theology and foundation as to who God is because God was in the flesh in Christ sitting at the table relaxing in this home and in comes a woman with a checkered past that Jesus was going to change. Let me read it to you. Luke chapter 7 verse 36 to 50. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat and behold a woman in the city was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house brought an alabaster a flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair with the hair of her head and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Now this is all happening in the context of a house. Jesus is addressing and healing the sinful past of a woman that feels ashamed, that can no longer hold her head up high, but just wants to bless Jesus with the articles of a trade that she'd been involved in. She wants to bring them and surrender them at the feet of Jesus. And in that moment, he's not only releasing a woman from sin as he forgives her, but he's dealing with the religious spirit in a man that had been so judgmental about the people around him. And Jesus brings these two worlds together in a home. Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. Okay. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but... She has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with, her, with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves. I mean, Jesus is radical. Who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Some of the greatest teaching on forgiveness some of the greatest understanding in relation to the heart of God as he reaches any and every person within our world. Nobody's off limits. Nobody's out of bounds of the care of his love. All of that demonstrated graphically, not only in word, but in deed within the confines of a home. A home. Jesus forgave and restored and made whole a woman with a shameful past that she deeply regretted in a home. I wonder what can happen in your home. I wonder what can happen in my home. I really do. Because I've said to the Lord, I'm telling you, man, my, my, my home is open. My home is not off limits for people to come into. And that would be Faye's heart 
too. And I'm sure yours isn't. I just want God to use my home in the street, in the community, in the town that we're in. I really do want God to use my home to bless his people, but to also bless those who are beyond the confines of this gathering even. Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. Jesus is in Capernaum. And everybody hears that he's in somebody's house. And as a result, they all just turn up at the house. He's teaching. He's relaxing. He's at home in someone's home. And they're loving it. And all of a sudden, the whole city has turned up outside of the house. People are there. And it's hustling and it's bustling. That's what homes are for. To be filled with life. Not just so that we can look after our families. That is important. That has to have priority. But oh, when our, when our homes are used as a vehicle, as a blessing to be hospitable, the blessing and the favor and the smile of God rests on it. Tell you now, what, whatever, whatever you allow Jesus to use, he blesses. He honors you, you. I tell you now, you open up your home to others. There'll be a blessing on your house. There'll be favor on your house. The Bible says, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything will be added to you. Mark 2, verse 1 to verse 5, it says this, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them. My God, I'd love that problem in my house. I'm telling you, I would. I would love my house to be rampacked with people who do not know Jesus. That would excite me. And if some things went walkies, well, we'd have to work out that one. But I'm telling you now, I want my house full of lost people. I want my house, I want people to know that they can knock my door. I really do. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them. Not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd... They uncovered the roof. Now, we've got a new roof on the house. In all honesty, I don't fancy the slates coming off just yet. But they were so desperate to get to him. They broke through and they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Get up, pick up your mat, go home. He did a miracle in the house. He brings forgiveness into homes. He does miracles in homes. You look at the Bible and you see that he went into a home and raised somebody from the dead, a little girl, Jairus' daughter. Jesus had no problem going into homes and being the Savior, and being the one that people needed him to be. Matthew 9, another scripture. Verse 10 to 12, now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. 
When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. You know, we could go through the New Testament. Because this didn't just happen when Jesus ministered to people in the three-year ministry that he had before he ascended back to heaven. No, this was a priority within the early church. We looked at Acts chapter 2 last week, and we read about how they met 120 of them in the upper room. Jesus had told them to tarry in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit had come upon them with power, and then they were going to witness for him. Then they were going to go out into their world and declare Jesus to be the risen Christ, the Savior. Holy Spirit came, a sound of a violent, rushing, mighty wind from heaven, sent them out into a waiting world. It aroused the whole city of Jerusalem, and there were people of many languages hearing these 120 disciples praise God in their own tongues, and they couldn't work it out. And it was, it was kind of a, of a crazy, kind of chaotic moment where the Holy Spirit's power had invaded that city, Jerusalem. And then Peter stood up with the eleven. And he said, these men are not drunk as you suppose. This is fulfillment of what Joel said in his prophetic word. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he began to tell them about Jesus. And by the end of that day, 3,000 people had been ushered into the kingdom of God. 3,000 people had decided to follow Christ. But the, the early church knew that to grow large, you needed to grow small. Whilst the church grew large, simultaneously at the same time, it grew small. Because in Acts chapter 2, verse 46 to verse 47, it says this, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple. That was the large celebration. Where they all came together and met and praised God. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And look what happened. Because they met from house to house and their homes weren't off bounds, it says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You go through the Acts of the Apostles and it begins to talk about you know, five, another 5,000 being saved and receiving Christ by Acts chapter 3. So that's 8,000 in the church as a result of the miracles and the signs and wonders. And they were all meeting from house to house daily, fellowshipping, communing with one another. But then it began to go to another level where the Holy Spirit began to multiply their numbers to the point where it became innumerable, an innumerable company of people within that city. And you can read in Acts, at the end of, of the book of Acts, the religious rulers looked out and saw the growing church that Jesus had declared that he would build. And they said to the apostles, you filled the whole of Jerusalem with your teaching. How do you do that? Not just simply by having a large celebration service like this, but meeting in homes, in homes. Now I've laid just a little foundation today as to where we're going. I'm gonna ask the musicians to come. We're gonna, we're gonna finish in a moment. You know, we're so blessed to have connect groups. We're so blessed to have people host homes 
that are committed to serving us with their hospitality, with their kindness, with their welcome, with their care, their prayer, their concerns. So blessed. But you know what? We need more host homes. And I'm just throwing a seed today. Throwing a seed out there. Maybe you could host a connect group. Maybe your home could host a place where people can come. Nobody's going to rip your roof off. You're going to receive so much by the people that you invite in. You really are. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. Let me read you another little line that you may have missed in your reading of the New Testament. It says this. Now this is Paul the Apostle. An incredible church planter. An incredible man of God that traveled right throughout continents to spread the gospel and to plant churches and to equip people. He says this, the churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Aquila and Priscilla were a team, a husband and wife team that had amazing gifts in preaching and declaring God's word to people. And Paul greets them and makes us aware of the fact that they had a church meeting in their home. Aquila was an amazing preacher when you, when you look at the Bible. He didn't have an, a mega church. He didn't have an office with a plaque on his door saying, Pastor Aquila, Sister, Sister Priscilla. No, they had a church in their home. Who knows why the church met in their home? It may have been because there wasn't any buildings. It may have been one of many churches within the city in which they met. But it was significant enough for Paul the Apostle to note and pay honor to it. Let me ask you today, as we close, maybe you're going to consider and pray about, even if you're not ready. I'm not, I wouldn't ask you to make a decision here and now, but I want, I want to put it out to you. I want to put it out to you. If you've got a pastoral heart, a shepherding heart that cares for people, that wants to help another, that wants to be like that good Samaritan that just can't walk by and ignore, but has to get down, and pour in the oil and the wine and bring a life that's lost back alive again. If you have those, those qualities and characteristics in your heart as a follower of Christ, I want you, I want you to pray over the next weeks to come. I want you to consider this and come and see us. I'm going to give you more opportunities. Don't worry. There's going to be plenty of opportunities for you to open your home to others. Or, or you may want to go to a connect group. And again, we want you to be part so that you're not, you're not missed. You're not solitary. You're not out there on the fringes. But you're part of everything that God wants for you within the home. Is that okay? Amen. Father, I thank you for your people today. Holy Spirit, Lord, as your word has been given, Lord, I pray that this seed would grow in our hearts. And there may be some here that never considered opening their home. Holy Spirit, I pray Lord, that you would just excite them with the possibility of what you can do in their house, in their community. 
through their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus into your heart, you know your heart is like a home. Bible says, Jesus actually said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He uses that imagery for our lives. He knocks at the door of our heart. And he says, if you'll just open that door and allow me to come on in, I'll fellowship with you. I'll be the peace that you need. I'll be the saving grace that you're looking for. I'll be the end of your search. Right now, I want to give you a moment, an opportunity to pray and ask him into your heart. Let's close our eyes as we do that. And let's pray this together, church. And if you're praying this for the first time, you pray it and believe it and place your trust, trust and faith in Jesus. Let's say this together. Lord Jesus, I ask you today to come into my heart. I open the door of my life and I ask you to come on in. Save me from my sin. I place my faith, my trust, and my hope in you. Thank you for living inside me. From this day forth, in Jesus' name, amen.